Recently, the bad news keeps breaking in China's real estate sector. China's second largest real estate company, Evergrande Group, has halted work on some of its real estate projects and made its first public warning that it might default on its debt. Moreover, the real estate company Fantasia Group, which has the backing of China's powerful red elite, has had its U.S. bonds rejected as collateral by banks such as Citi. In the coming year, Chinese real estate companies face a wave of peak repayments on their U.S. bonds. This time, with a long-touted gray rhino of a bursting real estate bubble in China arrive. Many Chinese real estate companies used to consider U.S. bonds as a surefire financing tool. But now the situation has completely changed. Bloomberg, citing sources familiar with the matter, reports that the private banking divisions of banks such as Citi and Credit Suisse have designated the bonds of China's leading real estate developer Fantasia's loan-to-value (LTV) ratio to be zero, meaning their clients can no longer use Fantasia's bonds as collateral to obtain mortgages. Citi, Credit Suisse, and Fantasia all declined to comment. Fantasia Holdings was founded in 1996 by Zheng Baobao. She is the niece of Zheng Qinghong, China's former vice president and a former CCP Standing Committee member, Jiang Zemin's close ally. Fantasia became listed in 2009 and had been developing real estate projects mainly in Shenzhen and Chengdu. Zheng Baobao has served as its executive director and is also the majority shareholder. Data shows that Fantasia Holdings currently has 11 U.S. dollar-denominated bonds on deposit, but deposit sizes of over 4 billion U.S. dollars. Among these 11 notes, six have an interest rate of more than 10 percent, with the highest interest rate of 14.5 percent. Previously, in July, international risk assessment agencies Fitch and Moody's downgraded the rating outlook on Fantasia Holdings from stable to negative. In August 2021, a company ranked among the top 100 real estate companies in China announced that it had defaulted on the payment of a U.S. $200 million bond. In general, Chinese real estate companies as a whole are approaching peak debt repayment, with 21.6 billion USD bonds maturing in the second half of 2021 and up to 34.1 billion in the first half of 2022. Looking at the broader picture, U.S. dollar-denominated bonds in China across all sectors will see a 9% increase in maturity volume in 2021 compared to 2020, and a 40% increase in maturity volume in 2022 compared to 2020. U.S. dollar-denominated debt in China will see a period of high risk. The number of defaulted U.S. dollar-denominated bonds in China has now hit a record high in 2021. As of the end of July, there have been 59 defaulted bonds. According to the China Index Research Institute, real estate companies will see a peak in debt repayment this September, with a total bond maturity of 83.85 billion RMB, or US 13 billion. The looming debt crisis of Chinese real estate companies is the result of a series of new regulatory specifications from the Chinese government since 2020. It has led to a steady stream of defaults by listed real estate companies in mainland China. Starting from marginal small companies, defaults have gradually spread to top 50 companies. Some real estate companies were once ranked within the top 30 in terms of annual sales size. The even more direct result is that many small real estate enterprises have gone out of business due to broken capital chains, debt defaults, and debt collection by creditors. According to the Chinese media, Time Weekly, as of September 5, a total of 274 real estate companies in mainland China have issued bankruptcy documents, including some well-known real estate companies. 
For example, one bankrupted real estate company in Foshan, its effective controlling company, has been listed as one of China's top 100 real estate companies for 10 consecutive years and has been rated the most influential real estate company in China several times. A year ago, on August 30, 2020, the CCP set out new financing rules, the three red lines, restricting real estate companies that have crossed the red lines from financing. At the end of 2020, the Chinese government introduced new regulations limiting the percentage of real estate loans extended by Chinese banks. Since 2021, the government has been escalating various more specific controls on real estate controlling the real estate market from the demand side, resulting in rapid cooling of real estate in China. As a result, the hope of real estate companies to accelerate the sale of properties to recoup cash has fallen through. Real estate companies are restricted in financing, making it difficult to offset old debts with new ones. Homes are not selling well and cash cannot be recovered, thus breaking the capital chain of many real estate companies. Regarding the future trend of real estate in mainland China, at a Sunak China's 2021 interim investors meeting on August 31, the chairman of the board of directors said the market is expected to be more gruesome in the second half of the year. International rating agency Moody's issued a report on September 2, adjusting its outlook on mainland China's real estate sector from stable to negative. It is fair to say that the CCP's regulation of China's real estate is unprecedented. So why is the Xi Jinping government doing this? Let's take a look at how the giant beast of China's real estate industry has been raised. China's real estate industry is perhaps the number one industry on the planet. In the 2019 Who Run Global Real Estate Rich List, China occupies seven of the top 10 real estate tycoons and families. According to the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the annual sales of the real estate sector in 2020 amounted to 17 trillion RMB, or 2.63 trillion US dollars. The entire upstream and downstream of real estate accounts for about 30% of China's GDP. During the reigns of the past Communist Party leaders, the real estate sector has developed into the most extensive infrastructure in China's national economy especially during the more than 20 years when the former party leader, Jiang Zemin, actually held power. Except for agriculture, China's real estate industry has driven almost all sectors of the economy to develop and expand simultaneously, such as steel, cement, coal, construction, decoration, construction machinery, and even household appliances. At the same time, China's real estate industry is also deeply tied to Chinese banks because real estate is the core collateral of banks. Since the reign of former party leader Zhang Zemin, local governments in China have gradually developed a unique land revenue, accounting for 44% of national revenue and 84% of local revenues in 2020, compared to a high of 40.3% in national revenue in 2019. An additional source of revenue for local governments is the issuance of local bonds. The vital reason why those bonds can be sold is that investors believe that the government has the right to sell land. To make more profit, the Chinese government has set the land price high. 40% to 60% of the price of real estate in mainland China is the cost of land and various taxes collected by governments of all levels, which eventually contribute to the high debt of the real estate enterprises and the high selling prices of homes. It is the root cause of the real estate bubble in China. Because of the greed of the Chinese communist system, land prices have remained high and have risen dramatically year after year, leading to an even bigger real estate bubble, creating a real estate beast that sucks up virtually all the nutrients in the economy. For example, at the end of 2018, the stock of social financing scale in China was about 200 trillion RMB of which the scale of real estate financing reached about 75 trillion RMB, accounting for more than 35% of the total social financing scale. Other industries, especially private small and medium-sized enterprises, have found it difficult to get low-cost investments or loans. Many small and medium-sized entrepreneurs have also mortgaged their real estate to banks. And all the capital from Chinese families pooling generations of savings for the down payment on a house, 
plus cash for the next 20 or 30 years also end up flowing to real estate. This has created a crowding out effect of China's real estate on other real industries. Most of China's real enterprises have to struggle to survive, especially the manufacturing industry. At the same time, in the consumer market, various other consumer demands have been squeezed, resulting in shrinkage. Chinese scholars and experts have long been aware of this real estate bubble. They proposed a slogan of time for space 10 years ago. The idea is to ease the bubble and bring real estate to a soft landing through GDP growth and future growth of people's income. However, it is precisely this time for space development path that has led the CCP to bet its hopes on the unpredictable future instead of taking measures to protect real enterprises and lower the land cost in the past 30 years. The reality is that Chinese people's income growth has not kept pace with the rise in real estate prices in the past 30 years. Young people, or people in their 30s, are the most vulnerable link in China's real estate industry chain. They have been caught up with the most expensive years of housing and the overall deterioration of the economic environment. If this population becomes unemployed and unable to repay their massive loans, personal debt will become a widespread social problem. In China, where there is no well-established personal bankruptcy system, this debt will follow individuals and families for the rest of their lives. Likewise, small business owners who have mortgaged their homes to banks are the first to fall in a deteriorating economy. In recent years, changes in China-U.S. relations, the withdrawal of more foreign companies from China, and disasters such as outbreaks and floods have made China's economic recovery unlikely. The demographic crisis brought about by China's one-child policy has also become more evident in the last decade. The economic benefit brought by China's enormous population size is coming to an end. In a downward economic spiral, if the entire economy continues to leverage wildly on real estate, demand in other areas will fall further. When it reaches a critical point where the cash flow of residents and enterprises is not enough to repay the interest on their debts, it is time for China's real estate bubble to burst. That is, there will be a massive scale of bankruptcy, business closures, unemployment, debt default, stock market plunges, exchange rate devaluation, etc. in China. It is clear from this background that Xi Jinping is facing a tough situation. If he does not take action to curb the real estate bubble and intervene by administrative means, then China's enormous financial and economic risks will come at any time. Thus, in August 2020, in addition to the three red lines drawn by China's regulatory body, eight departments, including China's Housing Construction Department, jointly issued a notice. The plan is to spend three years controlling all aspects of China's real estate industry, from development, sales, leasing to property management, imposing an administrative intervention of the real estate industry, and forming a complete set of closed-loop management measures. However, immediately afterward, a large number of small and medium-sized real estate companies went bankrupt. In a panic, the CCP issued regulations to prohibit real estate prices from falling sharply. Real estate companies that have reduced their prices to dump their properties have been interviewed by the Chinese government. It's clear that the administrative measures taken by the CCP are like walking a tightrope, making it extremely difficult to maintain a balance on all fronts. Now that all levels of government in China have fallen into the habit of selling land at high prices, it would be impossible to maintain their operations if they stopped collecting high land transfer fees. Against this backdrop, will the Communist Party's top brass succeed in bringing the real estate crisis to a soft landing by relying on a corrupt bureaucracy to regulate the real estate sector? Or will it fuel the debt crisis and accelerate the collapse of the industry?